everyone. Thanks so much for joining with us online today. We're so glad that you're here. And although you may not be with us in our building physically, we still consider you to assist you in taking your next step in your faith journey. I'd also encourage you not to just consume our content, but contribute to it. If you'd like to give to us financially, you can go to rhythmchurch.org slash give, and it's a safe and secure way that you can give right there, as we do our best to help people find and follow the real Jesus. Thank you, Curtis. How many football fans do we have today? Show of hands. How many football fans? Okay, so maybe like 75% of you, I would say maybe 80% are football fans. Well, it's kind of a trick question because believe it or not, the majority of people around the globe, when they hear the word football, they think of what Americans call soccer. So let me ask again, how many soccer fans do we have Ha! That's what I thought. Okay, like four of you. So like 2% of you are soccer fans. And so I was going to use an illustration, a soccer illustration to kick off today, but I'll just quit the sermon right now, I guess, since um, it's not going to fly. No, but there's this really cool thing that happens every four years. And I'm, I grew up playing soccer, but I'm just now getting more into it. Um, I'm becoming a soccer fan. I'm starting to learn some of the players and the really cool thing, every four years, kind of like the Olympics, is the World Cup. I don't know if you've heard of this before. It's, it is like the biggest deal around the globe. And since Americans aren't good at it, we don't like it. Or we act like it's not that big a deal. But around the globe, countries compile their best soccer players to compete in the World Cup, which is really, really cool. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of pride. Really neat. So again... All the countries around the globe put their best soccer players together and they compete for the World Cup. And in my opinion, winning a World Cup title is more impressive than winning a Super Bowl or a World Series or a national championship because you're competing against the globe, not just people in your country. It's really, really impressive. But every four years when the World Cup rolls around, God has a problem. If you did not know, soccer is by far the most popular sport in the world, and it's not even close. Roughly 3.5 billion to 4 billion people are fans of soccer. Unreal. Literally half the population, soccer fans. So every four years, God has a problem. And here's the problem. Can you imagine how many people are praying for their team to win? Literally half the planet is praying for their team to win. And the reality is only one team can, right? Only one team can win. So I'm sure it stresses God out. (laughs) Millions of people praying for their team to win. When we think about that, the idea of praying for a team to win, it's kind of silly. When you think about some of the maybe more important prayers of life. See, every four years, if somebody's praying for a World Cup team to win, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that big of a deal. But what about if you're praying for your child who has cancer? What about if your marriage is falling apart, and no matter how many counselors you've been to, it just still seems like, There's no hope. Or what if you've been looking for a job for months and rent is coming due? Or what if it's after three or four miscarriages and you're so tired of that feeling happening over and over again? What about those prayers? Those situations I think every single one of us have found ourselves in in life 
what about those types of prayers? The prayers that are maybe a little bit more important. What about the prayers that really do matter? What then? You see, because we're arriving at a passage in the Sermon on the Mount, this passage of Scripture we're going to read in just a few moments, and you're going to think, again, so many of you, you probably think you read this passage and think, well, Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. But what if he's talking about something maybe completely different altogether? So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. It's where we'll be. If you don't have a Bible, you feel free to look it up on your mobile device or I'll read it um, out loud. But Matthew chapter 7 is where we will be. We're going to start in verse 7. And I want to remind you as you find that, that this is Jesus' most famous sermon. It's his greatest sermon. It's like his grand opus. It's his manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount. It's the, probably, if, if you're just like summarize the kingdom of God, this is where we would go. If somebody had asked me like, hey, if you were to summarize the teachings of Jesus, I would say, go to Matthew chapter 5 through 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Just read that. You're good. So Jesus is, again, he's, he's telling this first century audience what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. What are the characteristics of our world when God is in charge? When God is king, here's what the world should look like. So we arrive at a passage where a lot of people translate it as God answering our prayers. So let's read this together. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others that you'd have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now these words are so fascinating because this passage has been translated millions of different ways, but the most common way is that if there's you hear pastors and churches sometimes say things like, well, if you've been praying about it and it hasn't happened, you must not have enough faith. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's almost like we turn God into some divine vending machine where if we put in the proper coins we'll get whatever we want and see what's 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 interesting about that idea is that the coins could be a variety of different things for some people the coins that go in the divine vending machine is faith you think well if i put in enough faith and i push the f5 button the snickers will fall down or for other people, it maybe works. They think, well, if I can put enough works, if I, if I do enough good things, maybe this God that doesn't really seem to like me will do something nice for me. There's a lot of people that view God that way. Like he's some divine vending machine. That if you just ask, you'll get whatever you want. Imagine this for a second. Imagine if everyone on the planet got everything they wanted. Imagine how much of a disaster that would be. I know it would be a disaster in my life because I'm having ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Not good. If I got everything I wanted, it would be a disaster What's cool about Jesus, though, is I think he has his finger on the pulse of really what's wrong with humanity. I think Jesus understood what the real issue was. It wasn't that humans aren't getting enough. It's that they're disconnected from the Father. And because of that, we're not wanting the right things. Jesus wasn't saying to this first century Jewish audience, these disciples, he wasn't saying this so they could get whatever they wanted whenever they asked. He was trying to help them want the right things. 
This was an amazing moment in time in which Jesus was preaching this amazing sermon and this his kingdom was clashing with their kingdom. The way of Jesus is so much different than the way of the world. His kingdom was clashing with theirs. I think a good way to think about this is if you are a parent. Speaking of parents, mine are here today. They're up from Texas. I love them dearly. They're sitting right in the middle. You should go talk to them. They probably have some embarrassing stories about me. But they're here today. And I want to share this story about one of my parents. And I may have shared this story before. But as a kid, I shared a room with, with my brother. And you got to remember, this is like the mid-90s. So we had like the border wallpaper. And uh, we had really cool twin beds that had storage underneath. You know, that was our kingdom. It really was. It was our kingdom. But what? my brother and I failed to realize is that our kingdom was inside of my parents' kingdom. And that's where we struggled. One story in particular, we, one day, or my mom had told us several times to clean our room. And we didn't do it. And so we came home one day, and my mom told us, she said, if you're going to treat your stuff like trash, you're going to throw it in the trash. And sure enough, she had piled all of our belongings into the middle of the room with trash bags. And me and my brother had to take our stuff to the dumpster in the alley. I'm not kidding. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That actually happened. If you don't believe me, you can ask her after service. We threw all of our stuff away. And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, how could your mom do something like that? How could she do that? See, but the reality was, is my kingdom was really underneath their kingdom. And yes, it was a hard lesson to learn, but in my parents' kingdom, they wanted us to treat our stuff with respect. In my parents' kingdom, the idea was that you obey the first time. Yes, they were hard lessons to learn, but you think I didn't clean my room, not clean my room ever again? No. You see, and that's what's happening with Jesus here. It says his kingdom trumps our kingdom. And the way that he does things is far different than we think. And it's so funny because when we come to this particular passage, we have such an Americanized kind of Western view of this passage and think, well, if he's talking about seeking and asking and knocking, he has to be talking about stuff. He has to be talking about accumulation of things. But that's just not the case. What Jesus is trying to get them to understand is it's like a parent. And he goes on and shares a story to explain this. He uses an illustration of parents. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is trying to tell his original audience, and he's trying to tell us today about the true character and nature of our God, that he is a Father who can be trusted. He deeply cares about his children. Don't miss that. Jesus is trying to tell them that God can be trusted. Not that he'll give you everything you want, but that you can trust him. See, in their culture, this is what's so fascinating. In their culture, oftentimes they would equate snakes and fish. I don't know if there's a lot of eels or what, but a lot of times those looked alike. So he's saying, hey, if if your son comes and asks you for a fish, why would you give him a snake? Same thing with bread and a stone. They looked alike. So what Jesus is really saying here is this. He's asking this question. Can God be trusted? And more than that, do you think God is tricking you? No. He can be trusted. you got to imagine for a second, Jesus was going around the countryside telling people to become a part of something new, that he was doing something new, and they're invited to participate. And they say, well, what do I have to do to participate? And Jesus says, you need to give up everything. And they were like, okay. Do we really think that Jesus was traveling around with 
in a limo with wads of cash wearing Dulce and Gabbana. He didn't have anything. So why would he be telling his first century audience, hey, here's the deal. If you ask, you're going to get it. If you seek it, you're going to find it. If you knock on the door, it'll be open to you. He had nothing. He even told his disciples, you don't have no place to lay your head. If you choose to follow me, you're giving up everything. So why would Jesus be telling his audience that if you pray for it, you'll get whatever you want? It's such a poor translation of the verse. We also think about the full context of the Sermon on the Mount. Just a couple weeks ago, Curtis taught on not being, what, anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. God can be trusted. In the very next part of the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about not being anxious for our life, but don't be anxious about anyone else's either. Don't judge. I've got it covered. Again, if you see the full context of the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is really trying to get them to understand is that you can trust God. In fact, if you did not know, the New Testament was not first written in English. Newsflash for some of you. It was first written in Greek. What's fascinating, if you look at the Greek words for ask, seek, and knock, they're written in the present tense imperative. Present tense imperative, which means it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just seek. It's not just ask. It's not just knock. Those words get at this idea of keep on asking, continue seeking, don't stop knocking. You see the difference? Jesus is telling, hey, don't let up. He can be trusted. Keep on. He wants a relationship with you. Don't stop knocking. Keep seeking. Continue to ask all the time. Jesus, in his greatest sermon ever, is saying, hey, this kingdom of mine, it's available to you all the time. There's never a moment in which the kingdom is not available to you. Continue to seek, continue to ask, and you'll continue to find. It's available right now. And it's something you learn. It's something you practice. We live in, in such a culture where we say, I want it now. But it's a journey. It's a lifestyle you step into. Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily. It takes time. And as we think about Jesus standing in front of this first century disciples and he's teaching them, what do you think he wanted to give most to the disciples? What do you think he wanted to give to them the most? With everything at his disposal, he could give them anything. What do you think it was more than anything else? We actually find the answer in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Don't miss this. Look at what this says. It says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Let me read that again. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom the kingdom. I love that. And I love the language. It says, don't be afraid, little flock. I think it just speaks to his care for us. And he goes on to say that the father has great happiness to give us the kingdom. Another way to describe this, and I think Jesus does this over and over again in the gospel accounts. Another way to describe this this gift that he wants to give us, this kingdom, is really just summarized with one beautiful word, life. Jesus came to give us life and life to the full. He wants to give you this gift of life. He was brilliant. 
Jesus was brilliant because he knew that sometimes people that were alive were totally dead at the same time. Jesus understood life in a way that we don't. His kingdom is so different than our kingdom. But the best thing about his kingdom is available all the time. And really what Jesus is saying is, hey, keep seeking. Keep asking. Keep knocking. My spirit will help you. It will reveal it to you. My spirit will be there. It will reveal you the ways of this kingdom. And so if this is all true, if Jesus may be talking about something a little different here, well, then what does that mean then for our prayers? If that's the case, then, then should we pray about our favorite World Cup team? Like, should I pray for that Mercedes Benz I've always wanted? Here's how I like to think about it. I'm a dad to, to two wonderful kids. And the reality is, they ask me for a lot of stuff. Shocker, right? But here's the question I have to ask myself. Would I rather my kids ask me for stuff all the time, the stupid stuff, along with some of the good stuff, or would I rather them not ask me for anything at all? You see, I think God is less upset or is less bothered by those that ask him for stuff all the time than he is with those that don't ask him for anything at all. So yes, you can pray for whatever you want to happen, but I will tell you God's not some divine vending machine waiting for you to put in enough faith and push the button so that he can dump something out. Instead, God wants something completely different. He wants you to continually seek, continually ask, continue to knock. He wants a relationship with you. Seeking, asking, knocking. The reason Jesus says to, to never stop doing that is partly because it's good for us, but another part is, again, God wants that relationship, and I have no doubt that God wants to hear from his children. In fact, Jesus, Jesus himself, in one of the most difficult moments of his life, he's facing crucifixion, he's vulnerable, and he has a conversation with his father. And what does he do? He asks him for a way out. He says, if you're willing, take this cup from me. But then he says, yet I don't want my will to be done, but yours. Jesus himself looked at his father and said, I'd rather not. If there's another way, I'd really appreciate it. But at the end of the day, I want your will to be done, not mine. And maybe that moment can inspire us. It comes back to Jesus' main priority. He wanted what God wanted. So no, God isn't a vending machine. You can get whatever you want. But what's the one thing that every person can keep seeking and always find? What is the one thing that every person, when they knock on the door, it's open to them? What is that one thing? It's the way of Jesus. Everyone who seeks a new start finds it. Everyone who knocks on the door of the Father's heart is welcomed inside. It's what we're made to do. Seeking a, a way of life that, that makes us fully alive. You're invited into that kind of life today, a life of following Jesus, a life where you die to yourself, a life where you submit and surrender to his will, just like Jesus did. 
a life full of purpose, a life full of truth and of grace and of peace and of love, the life of Jesus. You know, it's funny because as long as I've been in church, you know, you hear passages like this, and I've heard people tell me to my face, you don't have enough faith. You must not have enough faith. You've been praying for it. It's not happening. You must not have enough faith. And it makes me sad because I know many of you probably have felt like I did. You, f- you feel defeated. You, you, you've left those conversations feeling like, what's wrong with me? Can I just tell you that there's nothing wrong with you? Can I just tell you, yes, sure, there are moments in which we need to have faith. Yes, you're right. God can do the impossible. Yes, miracles are a thing. Yes, we need to pray in faith because God can and he will. But there's nothing wrong with you when something doesn't happen that you've been praying for. Sure, yes, God hears your prayers, but he's not the divine vending machine. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. And whether or not those prayers happen, again, I can't explain why. People ask me all the time, I've been praying for this, why didn't this happen? I can't always explain why, because I don't know. It would be wrong for me to tell you why, because I don't know. But what I do know is that our God is a father that we can trust. And whether or not what you've been praying for is going to happen, what I can guarantee you is that he's with you. That he's with you. That he's with you. He's with you. And he's for you. And he wants you to know him and to be known by him. So keep seeking keep asking, keep knocking. And I think you really will find what it is you're looking for. This kingdom of God, this beautiful way of life that can't be described any other way than the way of Jesus. A life of self-sacrifice, a life of love, of grace, a life of purpose. Let's pray. God, I'm just grateful for the chance to be here today and, and again, be able to read this, this beautiful message that you gave over 2,000 years ago. But it's a, it's a message that still rings true. I think so often we're, we're duped into thinking that it's our effort and and the amount of faith we put in the vending machine that something will pop out. But in reality, all you're wanting is for us to know as your children that you're near, that you're with us, that you see us, and that you love us. And I pray for those that may be here today that have been praying those kind of prayers, the prayers that really matter And they're wondering where you're at. Or they may be wondering what's going to happen. May they feel your presence today. May they feel and hear your voice to say that you're a father that can be trusted. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church.